And we're just going to re read uh, something in the epistles and see how that um, finishes out in the Gospels. Turn with me to Philippians. <clears throat> we're going to go to, uh, Philippians has four chapters. Let's see, which chapter will I pick? Philippians 2, and then what verse would I pick? Let's, let's, let's do 5. Philippians 2, 5. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And most of you know the rest of it and how he humbled himself and lowered himself. And I don't know that we see the extent of the selflessness of being God and becoming a man and then being a man and becoming a, a crucified criminal. I don't know that we really grasp that. <clears throat> but he did it for others. And it is the cross being the epitome of selflessness. <clears throat> um, but um, <clears throat> I guess if I'm going to have a title for this one, let's call it uh, Having the Mind of a King. All right. <clears throat> Let me start with the reading. There are those who view the kingdom of God as likened unto earthly kingdoms from the past. Okay, so the kingdom of God, like an earthly kingdom. Uh, I wrote, it is, it is a picture where we all dress in medieval outfits, living in a small walled community, having a king uh, over us who sets up a very idyllic atmosphere. Uh, the girls walk around in flowing gowns while the men are all dressed as knights in shining armor. <clears throat> Folks, that's not the kingdom of God, okay. Well, I mean, you know, it's sweet and everything, and if you're into those uh, Renaissance fairs, that's cool. But it's not the kingdom of God. It's not what God has in mind. <clears throat> all right, so <clears throat> let's take that a little further then. This is absolutely a fact here. There are, uh, <clears throat> there are those who think that Jesus wants to do away with a peasant mentality uh, because now we're all king's kids and we should act like it. Um, they say that you need to have the mind of a king. What does that mean? <clears throat> all right. First of all, most of you know my little... <laughs> address on king's kids we're not a king we're not king's kids jesus is the king and we're not his kids we're children of the father we're sons of the father we're it's not there is no such thing as us being king's kids unless jesus is out there having some kids <clears throat> uh, and we know that's not the case so that's just see now remember last class i was talking about you know i started evaluating the stuff i started hearing and i went you know what and that's fine. I mean, I'm not critical over anyone that uses it, but it's not correct. And, and it just becomes some sort of little happy, little, you know. Um, <clears throat> and, and again, you know, there's this phrase I use, peasant mentality. In other words, we're not just a bunch of peons. We're not just a, you know. And the, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but there is a, a particular phrase uh, called poverty mentality that, that's been used a lot. And <clears throat> You know, Christians too long have been beat down and, you know, looked down upon and lived poor and whatever, and we need to start acting like we're something and we need to get up out of that. And, um, and I think even somewhere I mentioned that I, you know, I don't really have a problem with that. It's, there's, a, there's a moving outside of the concepts of God into an earthly kingdom mentality. We're trying to set up something like that. So I want to address that. <clears throat> uh, what does that mean to, to uh, they say you need to have the mind of a king. What does that mean? Okay, you should be confident, <clears throat> strong. We're talking about a king. But you need to have the mind of a king. Okay, so you need to start acting like a king. That's what they say. You need to be confident and strong and in charge and in control and expecting honor and respect, no longer a second-class citizen 
a king's kid. <laughs> it's just, I don't care what you say, it comes back to that in their mind, though there is no such thing, all right? <clears throat> well, generally, I have no problem with that. It is not the mind that God wants in us, and that's clearly uh, not the, the mind that Philippians 2 is talking about. Let this mind be in you is the mind of the crucified, okay? And that man, the crucified, along with his mind, is exactly what God in, uh, in, uh, intentionally wanted to exalt, to kingship. Okay, now, think of that now. I mean, that just changes everything. If that's really true, if that's what he exalted in Philippians 2, clearly says that. Wherefore, because he did all this, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. <clears throat> so what is it that God is exalting? What God is exalting is that mind or that attitude, that mm -hmm. selfless giving. And he calls that king. He calls that Lord. And he raises it up and calls it Lord. And the raising up is an exalting. It is an ascension to the throne. You come up. You took the lower seat. Come up to the highest seat that there is. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about that a little bit. That kind of... <clears throat> That kind of king's mind was not the mind of Jesus when he walked the earth, but did that mentality change when he became exalted? Now, this, uh, this isn't the class that I'm going to deal with this in. In fact, it may not even be the course, but, but I took the time. <laughs> I took the time <clears throat> to go through the scriptures where it talks about Jesus functioning in resurrection. And what he does. And it's that same old self-giving. He's, okay, he's sitting on a throne. And yet he says, come boldly to the throne of grace and I'll give you help. He's still helping us. He's still thinking about us. He's still lowering himself to help us. He's saying, approach at any time, come boldly. Instead of going, oh, I'm the king and, you know, you need to do all this stuff. He, his heart and his mind is... To be there for us. Guess what? That's what God exalted to king. That's pretty powerful. Anyway, that's just one example. I, I'm, again, it's not my intention to share all that <clears throat> in this class right here. Um, so I said <clears throat> the that kind of king's mind was not the mind of Jesus when he walked the earth, but did that mentality change when he became exalted? Okay. Some people say that that was the mind he had uh, as a humble man and was necessary for that moment. But after being exalted, he went back to acting like God and like a king. <clears throat> My, my premise is that Christ crucified gives us the clearest picture of the essence and nature of God. Throughout, and we've done this before in one of many classes, we looked not fully, because I have, I have not shared fully what I've seen, but, it, but that cross is set forth to us as that's the love of God. Wait a minute. But God is love. Okay, go, you know, gel that together. Mix that up and see what you get. <laughs> what you're going to get is that this is the way of God, not just the way of God. This is his essence and his being. Christ crucified is a definition of God. And he, well, I'm, I'm reteaching something I taught somewhere else, but, but he chose to be identified by a cross. He is the crucified God. He's the only God that was ever crucified. And said that symbol, you know, 
of the cross is meant and will always be connected to him more than resurrection on a throne. When people think of Jesus, what do they think of? The cross. And he chose it to be that way. He said it so. He wanted it to be that way because he wanted us to know him. And this is what we got into in Philippians. And God saw what he honors, what is biggest in his heart, and he exalted it when he saw it. And he called it king, but what did he call king? The crucified. Well, this, you know, once that mind gets in you, then, you know, what was my last statement here? Um, <clears throat> now some people say that that, uh, that mind was the mind he had as a humble man and was necessary for that moment. But after being exalted, he went back to acting like God. Wait a minute, that is acting like God. <laughs> I mean, that's what he's trying to communicate to us. You know, we, most people just see God, almighty God. You know, don't anybody remember the class where I was contrasting uh, Satan with Jesus and we went through that? Anybody remember that class? I mean, we saw that Satan said, I will be like the most high God. And he started listing off all of the things that are the trappings of being God and king, but are not him. I will exalt my throne above the heavens. I will do this. I will, you know, and people will worship me and you know, come and bow down, all this kind of stuff. Jesus says, I will humble myself and I will come into the earth and I will become as a man and then I'll become as a criminal and then I'll be crucified by my very own creation but I'll do it for them it's a complete it's, it's diametrically opposed to one another so that when someone says but after being exalted he went back to acting like God and like a king and you need to also Jesus is resurrected now that's what they say Jesus is resurrected now so he's you know he's sitting up there and he's in charge and all this kind of stuff and you need to start acting like a king's kid. All right. You know, I, I'll just say this because I, I'm telling you, I don't have a problem with that. I just want to know Jesus and I want you to know him. It's okay to believe that if you have pursued the possibility that Christ crucified is what we preach even in his resurrection. That lamb on the throne is what we declare. Lamb, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Slain, the actual Greek word there in the book of Revelation, slaughtered, lamb on the throne is what everyone worships. Why? Well, because he's on a throne. Mm, no, maybe, maybe so, maybe some before they get up there and go, oh my God, that's it, that right there. That's what we worship. That spirit, that Jesus. That's what we honor with all of our heart. That's what, when we say, Jesus, I love you, that slaughtered one. And he has all the trappings of, I mean, he appears as slaughtered. I mean, we say, okay, well, he had the nail scars, you know. Go on. Revelation is trying to penetrate beyond a picture of, into a reality. We think slain lamb is a picture and the reality is a guy with a couple of holes in his hand. But the book of Revelation never pictured him like that. It always pictured him as a slain lamb. And that all the nations, all those would come out of every nation to that one. And that's what would draw forth worship 
God worship, not man worship, not religious man worship. God worship. All right. So for me, I mean, I, I believed the other way for a long time. But I, I'll tell you what, when I was in Bible school, when I, this honest truth, that lady will tell you the truth because she knows. Because I was seeing Jesus and she, she would walk me to my classroom and carry my books. And if we, I was seeing the Lamb of God then. And I was just like, oh my God, you remember that? I mean, and I, I would I would, we'd stand out there waiting for the bell to ring, sharing while everybody's in class and milling around, and then they give you a little tardy bell after that, and so she'd run to her class and everything, but we would just, we'd just be, you know, and at lunchtime, we'd be sitting in the big cafeteria with all the students. I got my Bible, I'm just going, oh my God, look at this. And I would see stuff like, be, you know, John says, behold the Lamb of God, and the first time he says it, he says that takes away the sin of the world. But then when when disciples are with him, he says to his disciples, Behold the Lamb of God. See the Lamb of God, not what he does, not in connection with what he does for you. Do you see the difference? Did, was he the Lamb of God that, take a, that took away the sin of the world? Amen. Amen. In nothing am I trying to take away from that. But I think that that can take away from him. I don't want to take away from the fact that his, he, the lamb took away from the sin of the world, but if we focus just on the fact that he took away this, our sin, then we're not focusing on him, we're focusing on what he did for us. And that's okay, I mean, you know, we're not talking about rank sin here, it's okay, but is it okay with your heart? See, he's so self-given, he'd go, just enjoy what I've, I've done for you. Wouldn't he? Doesn't he? Sure he does. But doesn't, doesn't, don't we see, even in the Gospels, times where something touched his heart, where times where like the woman with the issue of blood, she's just saying, if I, if I just touched his hem, this guy, his, the emphasis on him, he is such that, I mean, just the hem of his garment, if I touch, I'll be changed. That's how great this guy is. Jesus stops the whole thing. There's a whole crowd, and they're pushing and bumping and everything, and she gets in there, and she works her way in there. This little wounded lady with all this crowd and everybody trying to get close to Jesus and walk with him and bump, say, I rubbed elbows with Jesus today. You know, yeah, I was right there with him. I hope somebody had an iPhone and took a picture because it was cool. I, I want to be seen with Jesus. She's not wanting to be seen with Jesus. It says virtue came out of him. It didn't just say, well, he healed her. It says what was virtuous in him came out of him into her. Whoa, that's totally different than all of the others. And that calls for stopping the, the flow. When Jesus, he goes, all right, that's it. Somebody touched me. I didn't touch them. They touched me. They touched my heart. This, this touches my heart, and we're going to stop and celebrate it. So he didn't demand it. He didn't have to have it to do what he, he's going to do, which is do for us. He didn't. He didn't have to have it. But when it comes, he always stops everything and just, you know, and you know the other one, the, the ten lepers. And they come to him, and Jesus says, go and show yourself to the priest. And they went, and they were healed as they went. And one of them comes back. My Lord, they come back to, to him. They don't just go, yeah, you know, and go out and start a revival of the first church of the healed leper. You know, and glory, come to, you know, and I'll tell you about that guy way off somewhere but look at what he's done for me instead one of them 
I mean, he did say, go show yourself to your high priest. Nine of them went to the wrong one. Jesus is our high priest. But he comes back, and Jesus says, you've been made, you know, you've been healed. Were there not ten of you? Where are the other nine? See, do you see that he's, he's wanting us to draw to him, not just draw off of him? Difference between being a parasite and being in love. And so, and so then he says, go and be made whole. Well, that's completely different. He's already healed. Now there's wholeness coming. And, oh, my gosh. I, and I, I read stuff like that, and I see stuff like that, and, I, and it challenges me. And it, um, and it makes me question, what is your motive in this? What is your motive in that? What is your motive in this? Are you just trying to get something for Jesus? Are you just trying to be seen with Jesus? Are you just trying to, to be you know, draw off of him. I mean, you can do that not just by getting like salvation or healing or whatever. You can draw off of him by trying to become something as a result of him instead of just trying to be with him where he's at. Just, you know, Jesus, I'm over here. Come help me. Another person over there. Jesus, I'm over here in the woods. Help me. Jesus, I'm out here in the desert. Come over here and help me. So he comes in, he's invited into a little home there in Bethany. Lazarus sitting at the table. Or when Martha and Mary, Martha's cooking, and Mary gets down at his feet, and she just wants to hear his word. He's just, you know, this is, it, his word is coming from his innermost, out of the abundance of the heart. She wants to hear his heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And, she, and so he's speaking, and she just stops everything and gets down there and just sits at his feet and just, you know, she's, she's where he's at. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? She's not out here trying to get him to come over there. She is scooched up to his feet and looking in his face and hearing his heart. And Martha says, you know, make this lazy one get up and come help me. Okay, Jesus doesn't rebuke her. It's in one place it says he loved her. He is identifying something. I mean, she's, Martha is serving him. You know that? I mean, she's not, you know, again, she's not out being a prostitute or something. So he's identifying that which honors him and everything, and that which is just wants him more than anything else. Do you see that? Do you see that? That's a, that's a different thing that he's really trying to identify. And he says that Mary has chosen that part which shall not be taken away from her. But that's coming from him and what has touched him. I mean, you know, it's just an amazing thing. All right. So all of that said uh, to say that the exaltation to lordship, and we're going to really deal with this. This is the pre to that. We're going to really deal with that in the next couple of classes. And we're going to show it in a lot of scriptures and stuff. But I wanted to have a time in advance of that where we could just talk from the heart more or less. Where we could find where the spirit could feel the freedom to speak to our hearts um, above, you know, Bible school or, you know, another class or something and and could draw us a little more into him. <clears throat> so, so I said, okay, we're, we're talking about Jesus being a humble man, and they're saying, yeah, well, he had to be that way for a while while he walked the earth, but after, after being exalted, he went back to acting like God and acting like a king. 
So I just made up this little story. Imagine if a great king was looking to exalt one over his realm because he did not like the attitude of the up-and-coming prince that was supposed to take his place. You following that? Do I need to read it again? You get it? Okay. Anybody need me to read it again? Okay. Imagine if a great king was looking to exalt one over his realm because he did not like the attitude of the up-and-coming prince that was supposed to take his place. So he looked among the peasants and found one who was humble, who cared for the people, who gave up things that were rightfully his in order to benefit the needy. We must understand that if that great king exalted this peasant, he would be exalting that particular mind or attitude. Do you see that? Do you see what, what's worthy of king in God's mind? He would not expect him to gain a king's mind and to treat others shamefully or be like those who were before, that were prince before him. You see, in other words, he doesn't want him to change. He doesn't want to go, okay, you're, you're this way and you're so sweet and everything. You know, I want you to become king and then just act mean like everybody else. Just run over the top of people. And he doesn't want that at all. The very thing he's exalting, he's exalting because he prizes that mind, that selflessness, more than anything else. And it's only found in Christ. That's why we must be joined to him in a real way and be partakers of the divine nature. <clears throat> All right. Well, good. We may actually just finish this little section, too. <clears throat> uh, let's, it's going to be sort of hard to do that, but let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Okay, most of you know Matthew 5 through 7, right? <clears throat> if you don't, read it in the next two minutes. <laughs> in fact, I'll give you 30 seconds. <clears throat> All right, we will read a, a little bit of it here. Uh, Matthew 5 through 7 is Jesus' desire for that kingdom to be manifested in earth. Because you remember what he's talking about, right? We'll see it in a second. And there is no thought of getting people to heaven. All right. So <clears throat> let's, let's read this. Uh, Matthew 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountains. And when he was seated, his disciples came unto him. You know, the, uh, my mar the margin in my Bible says when he was seated. But the actual King James is when he was set. And I think there's a lot to that. When Jesus is set, then he releases it. When he, he knows the time and everything, but then we change it and we go, oh yeah, when he sat down. You know what I mean? We can, we can rob the scriptures of their true meaning if we're not careful. <clears throat> and he opened his mouth, praise God, and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, okay, and most people go, okay, well, that's talking about the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. Well, I got news for you. In uh, Matthew, he uses the term kingdom of heaven a lot more. In fact, that's this common phrase. In Luke, he uses the same thing for the same exact examples, and he calls it the kingdom of God. It is either the kingdom that is God by his nature, or it is the kingdom that is above, which emanates from God himself. And again, you don't have, just because I say this stuff, you don't have to believe what I'm saying. <laughs> just hear it and, and weigh it. All right? <clears throat> but interesting, he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor. You are perfect for the kingdom. You see that? Isn't that interesting? That's the very first thing out of his mouth. He didn't say, Blessed are the kingly. Oh, blessed are the people that are princely in their ways because you'll be exalted. He said, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. 
He's not saying blessed are the people that don't have any money. It's just blessed are the poor in spirit. Isn't that what it says here? He's talking about their tenor. Okay, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom. That's exactly what this kingdom is about, in other words. This is, now we're talking kingdom stuff, if you, if you talked in the vernacular of the day. Now we're talking kingdom stuff. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. We exalt, you know, in Christianity, and this isn't true all across the board, but, uh, but it is true in many circles. If you are mourning or you are down or you are, you know, struggling or whatever, you know, they come to you and they go, oh, blessed are you when you're happy, you know, and they do everything to get you happy. You know, oh, no, no, it's going to be okay and this and that and da-da-da-da-da-da. Don't, don't mourn, don't, don't, you know. Jesus would come to you and go, tap you on the shoulder and go, blessed are you. Because there's something deeper going on. There's something going on here. <clears throat> but the end result is you will be comforted. But see, isn't that... Try with me, if you can, to see the death of the crucified and the resurrection of the crucified in these verses. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the death. Such is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, comforted. You see, but mourning is an inward state and comforting is an outward state. Resurrection, crucifixion, okay? Or self-giving, if you understand. Not just crucifixion, but in that crucifixion to see the selflessness of, of him who would be king. Uh, verse uh, 5, blessed are the meek. I mean, this is totally contrary. This is all kingdom stuff, and this is totally contrary to any kingdom you've ever seen. You know, the Roman kingdom, as it were, was man, it was all power, all of them before that. You can study it out in the book of Daniel. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst. that are hungry, that are thirsty for what's going to happen. You'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful. Well, that's funny because a lot of kings and princes are not merciful. Well, I wouldn't want them to think I'm a weak king. <laughs> Blessed the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Woo! Pure in heart, what is that talking about? Your motive. Your motive. You're not wanting to see God for you. You're wanting to see God to be changed into that same image from glory to glory so that he'll be glorified in you. You know, you, you can just go on here, blessed the peacemakers. You know, doesn't say blessed the cheesemakers. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. What? What? No, no. Blessed am I when I can put my boot on their neck. On the reviler's neck. That's the blessing. Okay, let's put it a little different way. Oh, God, there are people who are out and they're saying bad things and it's wrong and everything. And, and so, uh, Lord, I just ask you to, you know, get them and just show, show them that I'm really not that. You're not one with the lamb. You're not willing to bear, you know, things for him. You have to justify your way through or pray your way out of it, you know. 
Is there a place for praying when you're in certain situations? Yes, I'm not, I'm not taken away from that. I'm saying there is discernment as to the nature of Christ and as to the need. There is discernment. We must find, we never violate the nature of Christ just to meet a need. Okay, well. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. See, he says, blessed are you when men revile you and, and say all manner of evil against you, right? But blessed are you when, when, when you, you know, part of the reason why Jesus was so mistreated was he never answered back. He never justified. He said, that's not true. You know, all he had to do was be a little, uh -oh, and they probably was okay, you know. But when you don't show anything, they'll rip you to shreds. They will. For righteousness' sake. Because you're with the Lord. Because you refuse to violate Christ to make you comfortable in a certain situation. Or you, you know, you know. All of you have experienced some of these things. But, but the goal is that we bring the kingdom in earth. That's the goal. And if something doesn't violate that, then let's love everybody and let's pray for them. And let, you know what I mean? And let's cover them and let's be there for them and let's exalt others above ourselves. You know what I mean? I mean, the scriptures say that. There's nothing wrong with that, but make sure it's not some form of not being pure in heart. <clears throat> All right. Um, uh, let's see. Matthew 5 through 7 is Jesus' desire for that kingdom to be manifested in earth, and there is no thought of getting people to heaven. That kingdom is not of earthly origins because earthly kingdoms fight for their existence and rights that's john 18 36 when when the mob came to take jesus and take him to crucify him peter drew his sword and he struck one of them and jesus said put your sword but he rebuked he's not rebuking the people that are coming to kill him he's rebuking his own that's not our spirit put your sword away reaches up there and sticks the guy's ear back on you know because you know i'm here to bless my enemies you know that's not what we're i you know if my kingdom was of this world see here's the way we always view that scripture if my kingdom was of this world then uh you know we would all just fight for it but I, my kingdom's really up in heaven, so we don't fight for anything down here. That's the way most people view it. If my kingdom is of this world, but it's not, it's up here, so we're not going to fight for it. Y'all take it. But that's not what he's saying. He says, if my kingdom was the same as this world, you fight for what you, 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 you know, try to take and hold and everything else. But mine's not. And, that's, and he's saying to Peter, Put your sword away. We're, that's not the way we are. That's not kingdom people. Use weird terminology. Let me see. Um, that, that kingdom is not of earthly origins, meaning it's the substance of it is not of this earth. Therefore, because earthly kingdoms fight for their existence and their rights. But ours is here, but it's not like that. The Lord wanted to establish a kingdom within a kingdom right here on earth. It has to do with how we treat one another or another way of saying it or what kingdom we live by. All right, and then, uh, well, I think we got just a few more seconds. Let's go to Matthew 25. And I want to show you something you may never have noticed or maybe you have. Matthew 25, verse 40. 
this is all Jesus speaking here. And he says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Okay. So he's saying, <clears throat> he's saying, look, the king answers. The king answers, it says here. Look, if you've done this to the least, you've done it unto me. In other words, if, if I switch places with that least guy <laughs> and put him on my throne for a week and I just walk around in his rags, you'd treat me the same way. Think about it. You know, you're honoring the throne and the crown and all that kind of stuff. But if I switched off with this guy, and, and that's what Jesus did. He switched off and he came down here in the earth and he didn't have a king and he didn't have all that. And he was uh, treated the way that he was treated. If they knew it was God, you think they'd have done all that? No way. So, so the king is saying, look, here's how I look at it. If you do this the least, you're doing it to me already because you're already off because you think it's all about status and money and this and that and I'll respect somebody that's got that but this, this person over here, there's nothing to respect. It, it's not based on what's in them. It's based on what's in you and in me. But here's an interesting, here's an interesting verse, uh, verse 45. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Whoa! Anybody see the difference? The first one is, if you do, if you do you know, this to them, you do it to me. But he's going, if you wouldn't do this for them, you wouldn't do it for me. Because you're not honoring me, you're honoring the crown or the, the throne, the trappings, the status and the trappings of royalty or of whatever, you know, prestige or, you know, something, you know, money or something that you're honoring. And Jesus is saying, <clears throat> you know, we need to be motivated not by what's out there, but by what's in us, and what's in us is Christ. And if you do that, and if, you, if, if there were certain people who did that when Jesus walked the earth, they would go, look, I don't know if he's the son of God, but I'll tell you what, I don't, you know, this is wrong, you know what I'm saying? Or, or I'll take it for him, or, but you know, if for a good man, one would dare to die. Oh, yeah, well, that's wrong. <laughs> we never look at that scripture like it's wrong. But that's, it's saying that basically that's wrong. If you, you know, if that's your basis of it, but the love of God has been, and then none of us deserved it, and he died for all of us. It didn't matter to him who or what or what. But we go, well, that, that guy deserved, I'll, I'll, I'll throw myself in front of a bullet. I'll take a bullet for him. Well, what about this bum over here? Nah. Well, be careful lest you entertain angels unaware. Yes. Yes. Well, it is, but the, you know, there's a, there is a authority and stuff, and there is that in the scriptures. This shouldn't violate authority, but it, this is the kingdom. This is, this is Christ in us, and in that sense, it shouldn't be so important to honor the office. Then we should give honor. What does it say? Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of the Lord. Submit, you know, and it does say submit yourselves to this person. Submit, but submitting yourself, because see, it's really bring it brings it right down to look. We need to just be this way, in general. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Let me read this, and we'll be done. Um, his view was that when you did good things to the least, that you're doing it to him because he. And we're going to see this 
um, pretty soon, all oh, the scriptures, they're going to give us an incredible picture of the kingdom of God. And it's going to have to do with this right here. His view was that when you did good things to the least, you did it unto him. In other words, your nature had equal love and equal self-giving to all regardless of status. But when you do it unto him, but not lesser ones, you are not only doing it unto him, you are not doing it unto him, for he sees through it and does not receive it. Because you, you're, you're saying, I'm, you know, I'm doing this for him, but you're not. You're doing it because of somebody's status or position. You're not honoring him. Also, when you did not do it for them, you did not do it for him either and would have failed to do so when he walked without official glory. Official glory meaning the trappings of godhood and kingdom and all that stuff. He just walked as a man. And they, had, they knew him as a carpenter's son. And that's what they said. You know, is this the carpenter's son? And he didn't say, no, no, I'm God's son. You know, I almost never remember that. I mean, I know, I know you do remember. He hardly ever said, I'm the son of God. He said, God is my father. You know, the emphasis on him. He's... He's my father. The other way is, I'm a son of God. You say, well, it's just semantics. No, it's not. It's a difference of emphasis on who's being emphasized. You know. And this thing of official glory, and some of you know we go way back on that one, and just, it's just huge that he gave up his official glory just to see how we would treat him. And we didn't do so good, folks. We didn't do so good. And Jesus is in people all around you, not just in this church, in other places. You've got to be careful who you dishonor and who you say things about, you know. I mean, Jesus looked like a criminal. And, you know, somebody can tell you, well, I know he's a criminal because I saw Jesus steal some money. And they, they were talking about Judas, but they knew somebody did or they heard that, Uncle so-and-so said, well, that same thing happens today. He could literally be the life of Christ in somebody who was not going to justify themselves, and we set out to take them down. I mean, it's just wise to be careful. Be careful. Let's pray. Father, we ask you to continue to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit he will guide us into all truth. And Father, I ask you to forgive me for any frail words that I speak that do not honor you or your son, uh, that my wording was not uh, honorable to you, that I somehow, in my ignorance and my darkness, I missed uh, the true point. I ask you to forgive me, but I ask you to go beyond forgiving me. I ask you, bring me into the light that I may feed your people in good pastures and lead them toward you to see you in your fullness. I ask you to bless this people, Lord. I ask you to bless them with your heart and your word and your word flowing from your heart into their heart. And Lord, bring us all together in the one that we are in already. Make it real to us. Make us of one mind and one spirit and one accord and one place. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed.